On September 23, 1934, the team formerly known as the Portsmouth Spartans played their first game at the Detroit Lions. In this same year, an arch nemesis to the future Lions was born. Then, this week's guest was able to have a unique experience with the same guy after his retirement. We all know this name, and that name is Bart Starr. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is January 9th, 1934, and we are in Montgomery, Alabama. The reason why is because this is the birth date of one of the biggest names in NFL history. Yes, Mr. Bart Starr. But why are we here? Is this an episode of Bart Starr? Well, in a way, it kind of is. Because this week's guest, which is part two of a two-part interview with Joe Zagorski, man, this guy had a very cool, unique encounter with Bart Starr, one of his living legends at the time. And most people will never get a chance to do this with their own living legend. But this week's guest, Joe Zagorski, was able to do that. And one of the reasons is because he was an author. Well, he was a writer at the time. Now he's an author of three books on the NFL. Most of them about the 1970s. This is part two of that interview. So if you didn't listen to the first episode, well, uh, pause this button, go back, listen to part one. And the easiest way to get to part one probably is the link on the show notes. You can get there as well as all of Joe's books if you wish to purchase them over at thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, I ask you please subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest of the press episodes well each and every week. But for now, let's go ahead and dive back into part two of the interview with Mr. Joe Zagorski. And then another one that you wrote, which I believe came out, was it this year? Yeah. The one with yeah, Willie Lanier? Yeah. Early what this was year. the perspective for that one? Well, that's another unique story. Um, I was driving up to Canton, Ohio, to do research on the 72 Packers book. A friend of mine by the name of Chris Willis, who you know, um, he works at NFL Films, and he had emailed me, and I'm at a truck stop uh, on the way into Ohio, and I got an email from him, and he said um, that his publisher, which is not the publisher that I'd used for the NFL in the 70s and the Packers book, wanted to talk to me. And so I emailed that person and they emailed back quickly and they said, what are you working on? I said, well, nothing. <laughs> I mean, I'm under, <laughs> con- I'm under contract for another publisher, but not, not for you guys. And they said, they told me what they were interested in looking to find, which was a football book that had like a social aspect to it. So I thought about it and I thought, hmm, Nobody had ever written a book about Willie Lanier before, the first uh, African-American middle linebacker in pro football history that I knew of. I didn't know if anybody wrote a book about him or not, but I don't ever remember seeing anybody that, that wrote a book about him. But he's a Hall of Famer. And, he, you know, I mean, anytime you're the first of anything, <laughs> right. typically you, you should get somebody to write something about you. So anyway, I. I proposed this that idea to the publishers, and they loved it. Well, unfortunately, Willie didn't love it. Um, hmm. He didn't he didn't want to be interviewed for it. I um, I asked him three separate times, and he said no. And I think if I would have asked him a fourth time, he would have broken my sternum or something. Um, you know, Willie, big no linebacker, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I never asked him a fourth time. Um, but fortunately, I had you know my friend Chris Willis, and I had um, other people at the Hall of Fame, uh, the Ralph Wilson Research Library, uh, John Kendall, and by name, who you know helped me to obtain a lot of past interviews uh, of Willie, and and uh, with the NFL Films with a lot of transcripts to different interviews that they had done with him and some of his teammates, and then of course I was able to get in touch with. Uh, some of Willie's past teammates, 
uh, from college, uh, who also went on to play pro football, Mark Washington, who played for the Cowboys, and um, Raymond Chester, who played with the Raiders and the Colts. And uh, they gave me a lot of uh, information on Willie. And so I was able to write a book without interviewing, unfortunately, the namesake of the book, which doesn't make the book any better. Trust me, I, I wanted to ask Willie things that had nothing to do with football. Right. I had all the information I needed on him with football, but I didn't have any esoteric things. Like I wanted to know what he what he felt like, you know, in his senior year in college when he had heard that Kennedy was shot. Things like that. I, I wanted to know that type of thing to, to, you know, investigate his mindset. And I never was able to do it. Um, but uh, anyway, I thought it came out as as an OK book. It's um, it has a lot to do with the Chiefs, and there's a lot of information on the Chiefs uh, throughout Willie's career in there. Um, but I made the mistake of, unfortunately, writing too much. And I, uh, the, the publisher told me, eh, this is too long. you got to chop some stuff out. Like, well, how much mm-hmm. you got to chop out? And they said, you got to chop out 153 pages. I said, Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. What I, was it? Um, it was, um, I think I had over over a hundred thousand words, something like that. And anyway, they wanted it down to 80,000. So I began to chop and chop and chop. And I, um, I, I didn't want to lose the integrity of the narrative, which was hard to keep in contact with, with, you know, when you're cutting so much out, I was able to do it. Um, and it was probably obviously the toughest book I ever wrote. Um, because I didn't have the, first of all, the, the, the ability to talk to Willie and, um, you know, the fact that you have to chop so much out, that's, it's, it's a challenge. It really is. But anyway, it's, it's out now. And, um, I, I don't know how well it's doing. Uh, I'm trying to send it out to different media outlets, uh, it's hard to get people to to buy books, unfortunately, now when toilet paper seems to be what <laughs> people are looking for the most. Right, yeah. Now, yeah. now there are people who have told me that I don't like, but people have told me that they are using my book on the 70s as toilet paper. Now, those people, <laughs> they, they need their heads examined. I want to tell them right now over this program, they need their heads examined. I'm just being silly. Okay. But, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but – but be that as it may, because that was a four hundred some page book, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of toilet paper to be had. Well, that'll keep them keep them good for at least a little bit, at least. And but so I know the realization is now. I mean, a lot of people, not to make light of this current situation with the coronavirus, but a lot of people are out of work, and I understand you're not going to buy a book when you're when you've just lost your job. I know that. You know, right. You're you're you've been laid off, but. Be that as it may, um, I, I think the um, the book on Lanier has some new things in it that a lot of people haven't read before, uh, particularly some quotes from his that never made the air at NFL films or things like that. So, uh, you know, it's worth checking out if you're a Chiefs fan and if you're if you like defensive football. Um, I, I found out some things about Willie Lanier's um, concussion that he got. Uh, as, in, as his uh, rookie year with the Chiefs, and I didn't know that he had had blacked out a couple of weeks after that on the field, and was uh, had to be revived um, in the ambulance several times before he died, which he he didn't thank thank God. Right. Yeah. But uh, I didn't know that until I you know got more and more information on it. So that's in the book. So um, he's he's a success story. Uh, he he went beyond pro football to become a CEO of several major companies, and uh, he's he's definitely a capitalist. <laughs> you mentioned that you weren't able to get a primary interview with Willie Lanier, but you've been able to interview other, say maybe players, coaches. Uh, what were some of the most memorable interviews and some of the just I guess awe inspiring topics that maybe came up through those interviews? Um. Not in regards to the Lanier book, but many years ago, before I started writing books, I wrote for a couple of newspapers. I was a sports writer. It's kind of how I broke into the business. And um, 
I got a chance uh, by chance one day, one afternoon to interview Bart Starr. Great. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is an incredible story. Um, I got to, my boss at the paper said, hey, are you doing anything this afternoon? I said, no. He goes, I got a pass for you to go to Philadelphia to interview uh, Bart Starr. I think I snared it out of his hand faster than you can say, Jack. <laughs> and and I don't know if you know about the Philadelphia, but the Schuylkill Expressway, was, which is renamed the Sure Kill Distressway, um, it's, you know, I think I probably should have been pulled over three different times for speeding uh-huh. down there. But I got there in one piece. And the um, the place that I had to interview him, was at a Philadelphia Phillies baseball game in Veteran Stadium. It's no longer standing. But it was up in the luxury box section up there. And I'm thinking, I can't believe this. I'm going to meet Bart Starr. So I, you know, I go up to the luxury boxes, which certainly are a lot better. The food's a lot better than the other sections, trust me. And uh, there's Bart Starr. And, of course, I waited for a guy from another newspaper to stop uh, interviewing him. You know, newspaper etiquette. You don't want to bulge in, you know. So. Right, yeah. So anyway, I get a chance. And I say, hi, Mr. Starr. How you doing? You know, my name's Joe Zagorski. And you know, he goes, oh, please call me Bart. You know, so he's really down the earth. And I'm asking him these questions that he's heard probably about 700 times already. And yet he responded as if he had just heard them for the first time. Just an incredible guy. Well, he had his handler there with him. And he goes, okay, Bart, we're ready to go downstairs now. And I'm thinking, where's he going? You know, I'm I'm done with the interview with him now by this time. And he goes, oh, I have to take Mr. Starr down to the press box level, he's meeting his old teammate, Herb Adderley, doing a short show with him on his little station. Herb Adderley, do you you mind if I go tag along with you? No, 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 come on, come on. So there I am. I'm kind of like the entourage. Mr. Stone is his handler and me walking down, you know, there's Herb Adderley and they embrace and stuff and they, he's, you know, they're talking to each other and stuff like this and thinking, wow, this is so great. So the handler says to me after their interview, I said, would you like to me to get a photo of you and uh, Mr. Star, Mr. Adam? Would, would I? Hello? <laughs> you know, I was like, you know, thank God I wore, it. I wore a tie for this, you know, thing. So, right, yeah. so there I am. I still have the photo um, and I'm looking a lot younger. Because I was a lot younger. And, of course, you know, there's Bart and Herb and, you know, I'm in the middle. And I'm thinking this was this was a great night. This is a great interview. And I got a chance to talk to both these guys. So I go back up. I figure, what the heck? I don't have a deadline. I went up back up to the uh, luxury box and, you know, partake in some of their food. Sit down and watch a baseball game. Guess who sits down next to me? Bart Starr and Herb Adderley. And Not they, bad. They talked to me for about an hour about football and about everything. And I'm thinking, I don't, I don't have my tape recorder running anymore. This is incredible. And it's like, <laughs> I'm talking to these two guys as if they, they, you know, were just old pals. And so anyway, they're, they say goodbye to each other. And I follow Bart Starr out of the stadium. I'm not really part of the entourage anymore. I'm just walking behind him a little bit. And he's walking out of the front of the stadium and, you know, the game's still going on, but there's not many people mulling around and not many people recognize him. But a ticket taker recognizes him. A ticket taker. He goes, excuse me, are you Bart Starr? He goes, yeah. And Bart stands there, talks to this complete stranger for 10 minutes. And and it just goes to show you how incredible that guy was. Just an incredible man. And so I'm so fortunate to have met him. And to have interviewed him, um, so that that's that's the greatest interview I think I ever had. Now, what year did you say that would have been, that, or around? That was in the early nineties. I think that was in oh. nineteen ninety one. I think. Okay, so he was he would have been quite past his career then. Oh, that's yeah. like what? It, when did he actually retire? Would have been the in the sixties still, or did he make it to the seventies? Well, he was he he played his last year as a player was seventy one. And then, of course, he became a head coach in 75 for Green Bay. And uh, I believe his last year coaching was like maybe 86 or something like that. I'm thinking it's around there in the the mid to late 80s that he was a 
than last year head coach. And I know Packer fans are going to say, you're wrong. Well, it, whatever it is, it's, you know, it's just cool that you're able to be up in the press box like that. Like you said, talking to him like he's just another dude. Yeah, yeah, just an incredible guy and the greatest interview I've ever had. And I don't think anything will surpass it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that was, uh, that'd be like maybe me if I sit down and I'm just talking to Barry Sanders for just about what's going on today. I mean, I'm... I wouldn't mind, you know, interviewing Jennifer Garner, but she doesn't play football. So. Yeah, that's a little bit different situation. Very much so. Uh, so speaking of writing, I, I know that you also would write for the Pro Football Researchers Association. Um, what That would be the Coffin Corner then? Yes. And then what were some of the, I don't know, favorite, most interesting articles that you had at that point? I like to focus on, on different games, um, I, you know, and so that's what I would do. But then... I'd also um, try to hit on different uh, famous players that really aren't thought of as famous. I, I recently did an article for them. Uh, I guess it'll be coming out pretty soon on Otis Armstrong. The average person might say, who's that? Well, he used to play for the Denver Broncos, and he led the league in rushing in 1974. He, he broke up the O.J. Simpson string of uh, four straight years of, uh, you know, leading the league in rushing. O.J. led at 72, 73, 75, and 76, and Otis Armstrong led it in 74. He averaged 105 yards a game, I think. And back at that time, it's 14-game season. And the Broncos weren't a strong team by any measure. They didn't make the playoffs that year. Um, I think they had like a 7-7 seven and seven season or something like that. So, the, you know, he was being keyed on a lot. So I, I always try to find some kind of a, you know, something that interests me as much as might interest the public. Um, I also wrote a story on a, a division playoff game in 1970 between the 49ers and the Vikings in Minnesota. And the 49ers were underdogs. They weren't expected to win. And going up in, in Minnesota, and it was like, I think it was eight degrees that day. And they they pulled out an upset. Um, and it was kind of like, in in a way, uh, a victory of the passing game over over the running game because uh, John Brody was able to throw quite successfully against one of the greatest defenses of all time. And he did really well. So uh, even at that time, you could find an occasional person, you know, like a John Brody or a Joe Namath, who could throw a lot against a tough defense. Yeah, and... Uh... Speaking of writing, Pro, Pro Football Research Association, then your books, uh, what's the process for you? When You said that the publisher told you your your title of the book. The publisher told you, let's just chop out all these pages. How does that even go for somebody that wants to get into writing a book? Um, you, you basically have to have an idea to begin with. And you have to be able to, you know, write about that idea in, in, you know, in, in like a page or two to describe what kind of the thing you're thinking of and just go fishing, just throw it out there to different publishers and see if somebody takes a bite at it. Um, how I broke into writing books was kind of weird in a way. I was a member of the Pro Football Researchers Association and I would attend their conferences, which are typically once every two years. And uh, a book publisher uh, was there at one of them, and they um, I, I talked to the, the, the guy, and, and I asked him, uh, you know, is it hard breaking into writing books? And he goes, no, not for us. It isn't if your idea is good and we like it. And he goes, are you working on anything? And I said, well, I was thinking about working on this book on the 1970s in pro football. And he said, well, you know, we just recently published a book about the 70s in baseball. It'd be kind of neat to have a companion football book under the same type of decade. So he said, why don't you send us something that you have? And I said, okay. So I started working in earnest. And a few months later, I sent him a few a few sample chapters. Uh, about a week or two weeks later, I can't remember how much, I got a letter back from them. They said, we want to publish your book. I said, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's great. We'll give you... You know, and of course, you know, when you hear that, you're thinking, wow, this is great. You know, no, you're not going to get rich. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's basically you, you it's 
And then if you sell like 1,500 copies, you'll get 10%. Mm -hmm. Basically means that you can afford a Happy Meal for every book that you sell, basically. Right. You know, so, but, but at that time, I really wasn't concerned about the money. And, and, you know, and, and I'm still not, I, I, I just like to get it, get the story out there, get it published and leave something to my legacy. I don't have kids. So I, I just like something to say, Hey, I was here in the mm-hmm. world. So, um, I took him up on it. I signed the contract. I, I wrote a lot. I, I probably could have written more than I did. It was over 434 pages or something like that. Yeah, it's a good size. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and, you know, the thing is the, the publisher that probably published it, they have really small typeset, very small. So they, <laughs> they don't want to spend money on pages, you know? Uh-huh. So there's a lot there. There's like almost two books in one. Um, and of course, another thing I found out is that you don't set the price. Um, they do. So besides them deciding on the title, they also decide on the price. Well, mm. I saw what the price is. I'm thinking nobody's going to buy this, but I didn't realize that the market was there for it. The, there were people that were my age in our fifties that loved the football in the seventies. And there hadn't been a, there'd been a few football in the seventies books, but nothing like what I did, which was a comprehensive chapter every one year per chapter, like sort of thing. And, so it sold pretty well. It's it sold over 1,600 copies. And I'm thinking, well, mm. it's pretty good for, you know, a nobody. Nobody's heard <laughs> of me before. But it really helped me to get, um, like, the deal with the, the 72 Packers. And, and it also um, helped me to get, you know, other players to respond to me. And, of course, my the, the subject of my fourth book, which I'm working on right now, uh, Bill Bradley, who led the uh, NF, he was the first man to lead the NFL in interceptions two years in a row. He played for the Philadelphia Eagles in the 70s. Um, I sent him a copy of my first book on the 70s, and he said, "You know why I decided to go with you?" And I said, "Why?" Because <laughs> this is how crazy it is. He he said, "I looked in the index of your your book on the 70s, and I saw my name under, uh, and, and I saw I was on four different pages." And those pages were all four of my lucky numbers. <laughs> That's you, funny. You know, but he's a character. So oh, is he? Yeah. And um, I I had heard years ago that he was looking for somebody to write a book about him. But by then, I was so involved in so many other projects that I didn't have the time. And then after the Lanier book was finally done, I sent the proofs in. I was thinking, why don't I contact him and see if he's still interested, uh, you know, if he's still alive? Sure. And his answer was yes, you know, and I was, you know, I'm kind of happy because um, I've interviewed him now five times and I hope to go to Texas later this year to, you know, visit him in person. But every time yeah, we talk, it's it's like he tells me something else that's even more hard to believe. Um, he's just an incredible character. Um, he he I, I don't know of too many young college players who when they get the chance to meet the president of the United States, turn him down in order to go out with a girl that they just met. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so <laughs> sounds like a guy I got to get on the show and get some of those stories. Yeah, yeah, you, he's he's <laughs> incredible. He's something else, and you know, but uh, really down to earth and um, funny as all can be. And if you ever talk to him on the phone, if you don't get him, you'll get his voicemail. And his voicemail, he's singing a song. So. That's <laughs> funny. Yeah. <laughs> Just was he? So he a good old country boy, or is well, he he's from Texas? And okay, yeah, pretty much. But really down to earth, and really kind of like a product of the '60s. Grew his hair long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, you wouldn't think that that would be the case for a Texas kid, but he did, and. Um, he he would you know he, he he would just he bought a Volkswagen bus and drove around the country with it during the off season, hmm. and um, you know he was even a campground host at different national parks out west during the off season. Try try to see if you know like um, 
uh, Tom Brady wants to, you know, be <laughs> right. the crown host today. Or so. I don't think so. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, it was a totally different era back then. And of course, even before then, which I talk about a lot on the show. And it's something that just is, is uh, intri- intrigues me at how different it is now compared to back then. And one of the questions I was going to ask that's basically an impossible task, but it seems how you were able to grow up and watch teams back then. You've done a little bit of study in. What's your belief? Could a team back then compete with a team now who has a little bit more as far as the strength conditioning and all that kind of thing? There's no way. There's just no way. The um, players today are much bigger, faster, and stronger. Uh, you just look at the, the, the programs of the 70s and you look at their heights and weights, and 6'4", 245 was considered pretty big. Today, mm-hmm. Today, that's, you know, that's a backup strong safety. Uh, right, exactly. You know, the offensive line today, if you're not 300 pounds, you're not on that line. And back then, there wasn't anybody who was 300 pounds, maybe a guy if, throughout the league. You know, so I just don't see how any team from the 70s, even the dynasty teams like the Steelers, could have competed against the Patriots of last year or the Chiefs of last year. If it was a fight, they would have stopped it. I mean, just no way. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's always something to bring up, but it's one of those things that, well, realistically, just with the physical improvements, it's just probably not going to happen. I mean, if somehow you could create a level playing field, then maybe it'd be fun to watch. But yeah, and more than likely, that's not something that's really going to be competitive. Um, you've, you've had so three books now. You're working on your fourth. Uh, if you could go back to right before writing your first book and give yourself one piece of advice for writing in the future, what would that be? Um, that's a very good question. I, I probably would say... Um, I would say find out before you uh, propose an idea to a publisher, make sure you have all your avenues available to you to get to be able to write the book. Not only having the amount of material, but if your book's on Willie Lanier and you can't interview Bill, Willie <laughs> Lanier, you got two strikes against you. Right. So yeah. I was able to get somehow the bunt base hit on that book, but I that's what that's what I would have recommended to myself. Make sure you have more uh, uh background investigations on on what you want to do before you propose it. Yeah, that makes sense. And um speaking of another question for going back in time, this is a question I ask every listener of the show and every guest of the show. If I could give you the keys to my DeLorean right now, you can go back in time, be a part of any game, moment, whatever it is in the history of the NFL, but you can't change the outcome. Not cool. Where would you go? December 23rd, 1972, on the sidelines of Three River Stadium, watching the Immaculate Reception happen. You can see it on television. (laughs) If you're standing on the sidelines, I, I asked Rocky Blyer once, he wrote the foreword to my first book, and I asked him, what were you doing on that play? And he goes, I'm embarrassed to tell you, Joe, but I had my back turned to it. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Are you crazy? Goes, uh-huh. No. You know, of course, and he, and he made some sense because you didn't know that was going to happen. Nobody no, did. nobody did. And and so he just couldn't, he couldn't bear to watch. But he heard the screaming. So he knew something was happening, and then the next thing he knows, he looks down, and Franco's running down the sidelines. That's where I would I would love to see that live. I saw it on television, but it's not the same. Yeah, no, being, like you said, on the sidelines to experience that raw emotion of feeling you're down, and then all of a sudden, like, how do they pull that off? And as a Lions fan, on the flip side of that, I was at a Buffalo Wild Wings that I don't know if it was Monday night or Thursday night, but that Hail Mary at Aaron oh, Rodgers yeah. at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm walking out of the stadium or out of the of the Buffalo Wild Wings just um, I'm assuming we win. And I gotta stop just to watch the screen and all of a sudden that big tight end comes out of the sky and you're like, come on, but that's gotta be from a Packers perspective, 
not as cool as the immaculate perception reception maybe because of the the gravity of the situation right but man that would be cool to be on the sidelines you know and and it's it's funny about like with pro football isn't it the, the memories that we have that last seem to last they came from postseason games playoff games you know um there's a lot of regular season games that you can remember but not as memorable as these postseason uh masterpieces I think for me, the reason why, and maybe a lot of other people, is because unlike other sports, professional sports, that one play and that one game changes everything. Yes. You're not best of seven. You're not best of three, whatever they have in those other leagues. It's now you win or you lose. You go home or you go on. It's one or the other. Yes. And I think for me, that's why there's so much passion and emotion in each play. It's like a story, a guest I've had before talked about why he liked he loves the game so much because all those little plays are like a story leading up to the climax of the either the touchdown or stopping the play and it's unlike most other sports because basketball you're going back and forth baseball you hit it or you miss hockey is somewhat similar the same thing of basketball but football it's that drive it takes so much just building up and then all of a sudden at the very end you get that score or uh, you get the interception one or the other (laughs) or the heartbreak and as a We've already mentioned this, the Detroit Lions fan. I'm normally on that other side of the thing, the heartbreak situation. Well, but but I will tell you, you know, you're not shut out from the playoffs because the Lions made the playoffs in 1970. Now, of course, they got shut out in the game that they played. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but right, yeah. But they at least they can say they made the playoffs in the decade of the 70s. So, yeah, I mean, I wasn't alive when they owned the NFL. My grandpa was. My father was not. But uh, <laughs> we'll just carry on. I'll just live through my grandpa. My wish and hope is that my grandpa's still kicking around, that they at least make the Super Bowl before he passes on, because I want him to be able to experience that yeah. like he did back before my father was around. Um, with that being said, I mean, any other Interesting nuggets, golden gridiron nuggets you want to give to the fans of the show before we uh, finish this thing off here? Um, well, unfortunately, there's no discount to any of the books <laughs> that I sell, but um, you can catch, you can uh, find them on Amazon uh, website, uh, Books a Million website, Barnes and Noble websites. They, they all feature the books and um, uh, just, you know, get a chance. Not necessarily, you know, I, I think that. If you, any type of football history that you explore, I think it's a journey that's worth taking. Uh, just because, like you said, it is such a winner-take-all type of a scenario, and um, it, it just, you know, it shaped my childhood and now even my adulthood in some aspects. So get a chance, read read uh, the the NFL in the 1970s, and you know, get to enjoy a decade that. Uh, we'll never see the likes of again. Yeah. And of course I'll include links to all three of your books in the show notes. And when you get a fourth one coming out, we'll include that one as well. Okay. And uh, with that being said, I just want to say, Joe, thank you for riding shotgun with me and the football history do podcast. Hey, it was my pleasure. I very much enjoyed it. And I'd love to come on again. Well, there you go. Now, how about that story with Bart Starr? Not just the whole point of, The dude was just a straight up good guy. But the fact that Joe just out of the blue happened to have the most cool encounters with one of his living legends of the time. And that's something that I hope that we all can get to. And I hope that you were able to maybe meet one of your favorite players or even just watch him at a game, favorite moments and that kind of thing. I suppose, well, hey, we got a name for that. It's called My Football Moment. And what do you know? We have another my football moment. This time it comes from Zach from Pennsylvania. Take it away, Zach. Yo, what's up? My name's Zach from Pennsylvania, and my favorite NFL moment in history is far and away the Philadelphia special, always known as the Philly special. But and it's mainly because of the story behind it is you know the backup QB comes on after the would have been MVP gets hurt and he's out for the rest of the year. Backup comes in, leads the team through the playoffs, and they're in their first ever Super Bowl victory. So I think the story behind it really makes it dope. It was a genius play by Doug Peterson and helped my Eagles win their first Super Bowl. And if you want to share your favorite football moment of all time, I played on the show. 
you can send it on over because I know you have one. I mean, whatever just popped in your head when I said, what is your favorite football moment of all time? Boom, go. That moment. I want you to record it and I want to be able to share it on the podcast for all the guests to hear. And that is the best way for you to do so. You can head over to myfootballmoment.com. Again, I'm going to put it on the podcast. So you got to head over to myfootballmoment.com. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.